proper corporate governance and active investors. We should have uh, also make sure that we're doing the right thing for society. Okay? We can uh, make sure that we consult with our stakeholders and that uh, we follow the government laws and uh, we have some corporate social responsibility. And finally, we also have to make sure that we uh, let the financial markets know the information in time. Okay, in that case, we can use the stock price as our objective. <laughs> so let's move on to talk about uh, risk and return. So we said that we we did some background on the time value of money and accounting that we need to know before we study the course, right? We talked about the objective, which is important. So now we're getting into here, right? We're talking about the hurdle rate. The hurdle rate is a rate which reflects the riskiness of the investment. So how risky is our investment? We need to know this before we can decide to make an uh, investment. Do you understand hurdle? This is a hurdle. Yes, so, uh, I have to jump over the hurdle, if, right, to go on. If I can't jump over the hurdle, I can't go on. So in finance, it's like, the hurdle is like the risk. If my profit, if my profit is lower than the risk, I can't go on, I can't go over. So we have to calculate what the risk is first. Then we calculate what our profit is. Is our profit higher than the risk? Then it's okay. okay. Profit is lower than the risk. Then should we take the investment? No, right? So <coughs> this is called a benchmark rate of return. So there's a hurdle that our project or our investment needs to cross or go over before we can say it's an acceptable investment. So if our project is riskier, the hurdle is going to be higher. If our project is not risky, the hurdle is going to be lower. So which is riskier? For example, investing in SK Telecom or investing in Naver? What do you think is a more risky investment? SK Telecom or Neighbor? Which is riskier? Which could change more? Which company has a stable income and has been existing for a long time? Which company just started a few years ago? Do you know? You're Korean, <laughs> not me. I'm asking you, which company has a longer history and a stable income? Which company just started a few years ago? Which is a risk, more risky investment? 
Neighbor, okay? So for example, if you what company provides electricity in Korea? What company provides electricity? SK also provide electricity. Then they get paid the electricity bill every month. People pay their electricity bill, okay? So that's not such a risky investment, okay? But if I invest in the IT startup, some new company that just started, that's quite risky, okay? Because they could be gone in two years or three years. So we saw some companies like, uh, which were doing before the social media, and then face like MySpace, and then Facebook came along, and MySpace went down, right? So that kind of company can be quite risky. So if you invest in SK, or if you invest in a risky new company, where do you want to make more profit? Where do you want to make more profit? Where do you expect to make more profit? If you're going to invest your money, you can invest in SK, it's safer, or the new comp risky new company, it's risky, right? So the risky new company says it's going to make the same profit as SK. Where are you going to invest? SK, SK of course, right? So if I'm going to invest in the risky new company, what do I need? More I need that company to tell me they're going to make a very high profit. I need to expect they're going to make a very high profit. So if I... The hurdle can be higher for the risky company, right? The hurdle could be quite low for SK. So I compare the profit against the hurdle, okay? If they make a big profit, they might have a big hurdle. But I might still invest because I think they're going to make big profits. Okay? So, <coughs> uh, the hurdle is going to be higher for riskier projects than safe projects, or riskier companies than safe companies. What is the hurdle rate? The hurdle rate is equal to the riskless rate plus the risk premium. So, I'm saying we have to figure out how risky an investment is, right? But first of all, we have to say there's a riskless rate. Is there anywhere that I can put my money and I'm sure I will get some return? If I ask you, they're going to make the same profit, SK Telecom, Korean government bond, or, or the risky IT company, where are you going to invest? Korean government bond, SK Telecom, or risky IT company. All of them say we're going to make 5% profit next year. Which one are you going to invest in? Why? Very safe. Are you sure the government will pay you the money back next year? Are you 100% sure? Maybe 99.999999, right? Or 100. What would the Korean government do if it couldn't pay you back? It can raise taxes. Right? Property taxes. Everybody owns a property. They can make a new property tax and get the money. Okay? So that is called a riskless rate, usually the government bond. In the world, the US AAA rate country like Germany or Finland or the US with some rating agency has been downgraded, but still is still an extremely safe investment, right? So we can say the US government bond. So we don't start from zero, right? If I can make 2 or 3% on the US government bond, and you tell me, I have great news for you, next year my company is going to make a profit of 3%, what am I going to say to you? That's great, you're going to make 3% profit, or I don't care, I can invest my money in US government bonds and get 3% with no risk. Which am I going to say? The second one, right? I'm going to say, I don't care that you can make 3% profit, okay? That's no good to me. I can invest my money in, in government bonds and make 3%, okay? So our hurdle rate has to start with the riskless rate, not with zero. So we start with the US government bond rate, and then we add on, then we add on a risk premium, how risky our, our uh, project or company is. So we have two basic questions. How do you measure risk? How do we translate this risk measure? 
into a risk premium. So we want to have a number. We want to have a percent. We can make a percent for riskless rate, currently about 2% on the US government bond, if we're doing in US dollars. So we need to find a number for this risk premium. So we have to, how can we measure the risk? How can we translate this into a percentage for our premium? So first of all, discuss with your partner, what is risk? If you like, you can check risk in the dictionary. Right, English to English dictionary. So discuss with your partner, what is risk? What does that mean? Okay, so is uh, Wang Dong Jun here? Wang Dong Jun? Yes. What do you think risk is? Uh, <coughs> Kim Jin Su, where is Kim Jin Su? Yes. Yes. So, what is risk? Uh, damage, like danger. Yes. In Korean, you say we like we harm. Yes. We harm. Some kind of danger. Okay. So, actually, the Chinese. Symbol for risk has two, two symbols, right? The first one is danger, like in Korean, we want. Okay. The second one is opportunity. Do you understand opportunity? Right. So risk is not just danger. We're also talking about opportunity. So risk is a mixture of danger and opportunity. We cannot have one without the other. So an idea in finance is that. If we have a higher risk, we can also have a higher opportunity to make more profit, right? So Neighbor is a, maybe a riskier com company than SK, but Neighbor could make more profit. I guess in one year, Neighbor's stock price went up 100% or 200%, maybe last year, right? So that kind of a risky company, it can make a higher profit too, as well as having more risk on the downside, okay? Whereas the safer company, like the electric company, maybe they're not going to make increase their profit by 300, 400% because they're just take, collecting the money from the electricity. They can't increase your electricity bill suddenly by 200 or 300%, right? So we're looking at an idea here that it's higher risk usually, but it's also, also a better opportunity. <coughs> So, the next question is, who, who's risk? When we talk about risk, whose eyes are we looking from? Whose shoes are we standing in? So, we are going to be standing from the shoes of the marginal investor. That is, the investor who is most likely to be trading the stock. So, we'll talk about this more, but we have some investors who just buy the stock for the long time, like the owner. They don't really trade the stock. Right? Marginal investor is somebody who's buying and selling the stock. So, we said that we can base our objective on the stock price with the constraints. So, we have the marginal investor who's buying and selling our stock. So, if we look at the lenders, they have a different idea of risk than people buying stock. For lenders, they have a limited upside. Right? Lenders, who, do, who does the bank prefer to lend money to? SK or the risky company? SK. SK, of course, right? Because 
The bank is not, even if the risky company makes 200% profit, <coughs> does that make any difference to the lender? No, I just lent you the money, I still get my interest back. You make 200% profit or you make a big loss, you still have to pay me the interest, as the same interest as the lender. They have a, but if your company goes bankrupt, we can lose our money. <clears throat> so when we're measuring risk, it should be able to measure risk across all assets. So risk of investing in gold or oil or stocks or houses, right? Should be a measure of risk we can use across everything. It should clearly define what types of risks are rewarded, what kind of risk is not rewarded, and provide a reason for this. And it should come up with standardized risk measures. So we can compare assets, like different assets like oil, homes, stocks. Okay, we want to be able to compare them. So <coughs> we should be able to compare them with a percentage. So we get an idea every year. We can also compare that to the interest rate of the bank if we have a percentage number. And also, our risk model, it should not just explain the past well, but we should also be able to use our risk model for guessing about the future. So the most commonly used uh, model for measuring risk is called the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM. So there are some other models, but in this class we will be learning about the Capital Asset Pricing Model. Okay? It's quite widely used and a little bit more simple than the other models without losing much accuracy. So <clears throat> we'll spend a long time talking about this CAPM model, right? So you can read about this in your own time also if you like. But basically, maybe we're, we'll explain about these words you might not understand now, but we'll go through it. It says that a portion of variance can be diversified away and only the non-diversifiable portion is rewarded. So, it measures the non-diversifiable risk with beta, is a number which is standard around 1. So, uh, beta then is translated into expected return. So, <coughs> we are going, right now you don't know what beta is, right? So we're going to explain about that. So, in any uh, thing, we can have variance. For example, we have variance around the height. How tall are people? So just we're explaining variance, one of the first words we saw. So what is the average height of men in Korea? They're getting taller because the diet is changing. They're eating more meat, right? They're taller than they were 20 years ago. What is the average height of Korean men? Nobody knows. What do you think? Have a guess. 175. 175, right? So here we have the 175. So most men, height is around 175, right? There are some men, what, who's the tallest person in Korea? Do you have any famous basketball players? Or volleyball players? Hmm? How tall are the, is the tallest person in Korea? Two meters? Right? Then what about the smallest person? We have some dwarfs, right? They're 100 and, 130 maybe. Right? Not many down here. So actually this curve looks bad. It's going to look like this, right? Like something like this. Okay, so most of the people is going to be around here. Around 175. Some of the people will be out here and some of the people will be out here. Okay, so this is the variance. Okay? So when we're talking about this for investments, we're talking about the difference between actual and expected returns. So expected return means we expect that next year Disney will make a profit of 5%, okay? It may be that sometimes Disney might make a profit of 100%, right? 
right? Or sometimes Disney might make a loss of 100%, but most of the time, if it's this one here, most of the time it's going to be around the expected return. This is a low variance investment, not much variance, right? Height, height is low variance, not a lot of variance, okay? But something else could be high variance, right? Another company could be more risky. It could be that this company usually is more variance around the expected return, okay? Goes up more or goes down more than we expected, okay? Which company would be a less risky company? The low variance or the high variance company? Lower risk company. Historically. Historically, the company has high variance or has low variance around expected return. Which one is safer? Low variance. Low variance is safer, right? We expect to get 5%. Historically, our return is around 5%. This is SK, right? We're selling electricity. We expect we will make a profit of 5% next year. Over the last 30 years, what happened with our profit? One year, it was up very high. One year, it was up very low. But most of the time, it was around 5%. Okay, here it was 4%, here it was 6%, okay? This year it was 6%, this year it was 3%, okay? So SK would be low variance around the expected return. What about a new company? They just started, but one year they were minus 50, another year mi uh, plus 50, another year minus 20, right? So this, again, we're talking about which one do I prefer to invest in? Okay, low variance is going, we're going to say, is, le is lower risk. Okay? We, of course, when we're talking about investment, we have to think about the profit, too. Anyway, the, the lower variance is a, a kind of a lower risk. So, if we look at Microsoft's stock price change, here we can see that uh, this is kind of showing the change in the stock price, right? We can go online and we can see how does the stock price change? So here is uh, 2001, then 2002, 2003, and then inside the year we have every month. So this month, the stock price went up by nearly 0 0.1, right? Then went down. And is it going up or down most of the time? Right? Generally, the Microsoft stock price has been going up, so it's more often on this side of, of the line. Okay. But this is just talking about the change in the stock price. <coughs> you can see also from the change in the stock price about uh, whether the company is risky company or not so risky company, right? If we are making a very stable return, our stock price won't change very much. But if our return is changing a lot, our stock price will also change a lot, right? If we make a big profit, people will start buying our stocks. If we make a big loss, people will start selling our stocks. Okay? So we could compare this just on a graph. We could look at another stock price. Right? Do you think Microsoft is a fairly stable company or not stable company? Stable, stable right? We can see the swing doesn't seem to be that big, maybe just uh, in one month this, this way. So we can see that... Uh, uh, this is sorry. This is uh, 0 0.1. So this could be up to 40% change in one month. It was the highest. We had 33% change here. But generally, in one month, Microsoft stock price doesn't change more than 10% up or 10% down. Okay. So <coughs> we can find other companies which have very dramatic uh, changes, right, in their stock price. So. <coughs> We we'll get an idea of whether a company is, is risky or not risky by looking at the hi history and looking at the variance, variance of the expected return against the uh, actual return. Okay? So this is uh, an activity that we don't have the computer room here, but we can do at home. Okay? So we can go to this link, find the information for another company, Compare it to similar companies in the industry. So this is the link for uh, Microsoft. So just looking at this 
graph, right, of Microsoft and other companies, which company seems to be more risky according to the change in the stock price? So we can uh, do some homework here for standard deviation. Do you understand standard deviation? You don't understand standard deviation? So if we have So you can look up standard deviation in the dictionary now on your smartphone because it's a math it's a mathematical term that probably you already studied in school. So if you see the Korean translation it can help, right? So standard deviation is just we have uh, five numbers, let's say 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, and 0. So we can find the average. The average is at 5, right? Okay. Then how far do the numbers deviate? Deviate means how far away are they from 5? So it's a little bit complicated calculation, so we're going to use Excel. Okay. But if we had, the average is 5, right? And we have these numbers. But we could also have 100, right? And let's say minus 100. Okay. And we could have uh, 55 and minus 45. And say the average is still 5, but the standard deviation is going to be higher here. Okay, this has low standard deviation. These numbers are close to 5. Don't move away from 5 very much. This is a high standard deviation. The numbers is quite different from 5, very far away. Okay? So we're going to compare the standard deviation of two stocks. Is the return closer or not? So we can make, click on historical prices in Yahoo, make the date range uh, 200. So just, we can use Yahoo Finance. Did you look up standard deviation in the dictionary? How do you say standard deviation in Korean? Hyojun Pyonja. Hyojun Pyonta. Hyojun Pyonja. Did you study about Hyojun Pyonja in school? In high school? Uh, okay. So you can go here, you can choose any company. I'm going to use Microsoft. So here we have historical prices. When we go into the company in Yahoo Finance, here we have historical prices. Okay, historical prices tells us the stock price in history. So we click on historical prices. So here we can see all of the historical prices for Microsoft from today, right? The prices yesterday and so on, right? So this is daily price. We're not interested in daily. It's too short term, right? So we're going to click on monthly and make the date range from 2000. Microsoft started selling stocks in 1986. If you bought Microsoft stocks in 1986, you would be quite rich, right? But well, we are going to start from the year 2000. And then the end date today, and we're going to put monthly. Monthly, and then get prices. So we can see the monthly stock price for Microsoft from uh, all the way back to the year 2000, right? So there are a lot of pages here. So we are going to use Microsoft Excel. So we uh, download to spreadsheet. So uh, <coughs> here we have download to spreadsheet. Do you understand spreadsheet? Okay. And then. We can open the table. Okay. Right. 
So how can we calculate the standard deviation? So here we have the date, and here we have the stock price, right? So what do you, the stock price is $43 today, right? What do you think the stock price was in, 19, in 2000? Have a guess. We can check, right? So, sorry, the closing stock price in 2000 here we say is 24. So it's gone up from $24 down to 18, 20, okay, up to 41 today, okay? So it's gone up from about 18 to 41 dollars in the last 15 years, right? So what we want to know is how much is that stock price changing? So we can calculate the monthly standard deviation uh, and then yearly by multiplying the monthly by the square root of 12. So in, in Excel we have a function for standard deviation, right? Do you know how to use Excel? You don't know how to use Excel? So actually we don't need any of these columns, right? Just the date and the... Uh, I'm sorry this Excel is in Korean, so anyway, we can make an equation and uh, we have all of this information, right, it is monthly, so we want to find out what is the standard deviation of this, uh, these prices, right? So we go here, standard deviation means how much is it moving away from the average, right? So we should have an equation, so equals, I'll try to do this in equals and then I select all of that. Okay, and then I need to find the standard deviation, so I think if I write in standard STD, it might work here, right? So we can see standard deviation average, right? So I choose this one. So, the average standard deviation here is going to be 6.8. So we need to make this into percentage, right? So we have the stock price. changing every month, right? And this is the standard deviation. So we are just going to compare this to the industry average. So we have another spreadsheet which I'll put up on the internet, the Opbar spreadsheet sheet, and you can compare the company average against the industry average, okay? So just follow the steps on this uh, slide, okay, and then we can discuss in the next time. So what we are doing is just finding how variant, how much is the stock price varying for our stock. Okay, so let's discuss this question with your partner. So assume that you have to pick between two investments. They have the same expected return of 15% and the same standard deviation of 25%. <coughs> However, investment A's highest possible return is 400% and investment B's is 60%. So would you between, be indifferent between the two investments since they have the same expected return and standard deviation? Or prefer investment A because of the possibility of a high payoff? or prepare investment B 
because it is safer. So discuss with your partner. So one of them, they have the same expected return. They have the same expected profit of 15%. The same standard deviation in history. We can see that they, they uh, changed about the same amount from the average. Okay? And investment A's highest possible return is 400 and investment B's is 60. So discuss with your partner, what are you going to choose? C, it should say C here. Did anybody choose C? Okay, next question. Would your answer change if you were now told that you could lose 100% of your money with A, but you could only lose 50% with B? So we said that with A, you could make 400% and with B, 60% is the highest possibly. And then, in uh, this case, we have lose 100% highest possibly, or lose 50% highest possibly. So, would your answer change? Discuss with your partner. <laughs> Okay. So did I did you change your mind? Hands up if you changed your mind. 
Change your mind or not? Okay. So we're talking about two investments. One of them, we can get more or we can lose more. But it has the same standard deviation. It means that maybe sometimes we got more, right? But most of the time it's closer to the average. Okay? But the other investment, more of the time it's further from the average, but there's less chance of going here or here. Okay, so it might look something like this. So that those two, even though they're they could have a higher return or a lower return, right? They can still have the same standard deviation. The same amount different from the average. Okay, just it's a different line. So some people are just indifferent, they say I don't mind, but we saw that most people put up their hand for this one. And this can show a slight preference of investors, that investors might prefer to get a higher return. Even though it's the same standard deviation and it's the same profit we expect next year, investors think, oh there's a small chance, even though there's a small chance I make a lot of money, I might do that. A little bit like playing the lottery, right? Do you play the lottery? Mm -hmm. Do you understand the lottery? Yes. Even though this is just a very small chance, just one in 50 years, it goes this high, I'm sti I still want to take this one because I can get 400% profit, right? So it could be that investors just have a little bit uh, of skewedness, this is called skewedness on this, this uh, thinking. So <laughs> we're going to talk we talked about variance and standard deviation. Okay, do you understand variance? We explained about the height, the variance, right? Do you understand standard deviation? We, you studied before, okay? So we're saying that the stock with the lower standard deviation, the lower variance is going to be less risky, right? Can you understand that? The closer the stock is historically to its own average, right? It doesn't move up and down. We saw. It you know, the stock doesn't look, the price doesn't look like this, it looks like this, right? Then it's less risky. That makes sense, right? So, the profit is not going like this, it's going lower. So sometimes it sounds complicated, we're using big words like variance and standard deviation, but what we're really saying is, sim is something simple, right? At this stock price, historically, the company's profit was changing a lot, going up and down a lot, right? The company's stock price was going up and down a lot. Then looking at the history, it seems to me like that company is more risky than investing in a company which has a very stable stock price or profits, okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, diversification. Does anybody know what diversification means? Dayang Pa, is that right? In Korean? Dayang Wa? Diversification? What does diversification mean? Could you give me a, a very simple example of diversification? Anybody? Do you know the expression in English to put all of your eggs in one basket? Put all your eggs in one basket. This is the opposite of diversification. So somebody, let's say you went to the to the shop on your bicycle <coughs> in the old days. This is from the old days. I'm not very good at art. This is a bicycle. You have two baskets, one basket on the front and one basket on the back. <coughs> So you did the shopping and you bought some eggs. Are you going to put all of your eggs in this basket? Or some eggs in this basket and some eggs in this basket? What are you going to do? All the eggs in one basket or eggs in two baskets? Why? Low risk of what? To lose all the eggs. Okay, so what happens if I fall off my bicycle? Why? This basket could get just I fall off the front of my bicycle, right? Then this basket gets broken, right? Then I lose all my eggs. But if I have my eggs in this basket too, only this basket gets broken, I only lose. So this is just a phrase in English. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? Another example 
of diversification is uh, when the Dutch or the English were going to India in the 16th century. Here is England. Here is Europe. Here is Africa. Here is India. Okay. So there was two ways they could go to India. They could go around Africa, right, or they could go around through the Mediterranean Sea. So if you own the ship company, what are you going to do? This is a very dangerous journey, right? Yeah. Going around here. What are you going to do? Are you going to send all of your ships around Africa to go to India? Why not? Because they're very dangerous. Right, so if you have a storm here, you would lose everything. Lose all your money. Okay? But if you send your ships the two ways, then at least you get half of your money back. Okay? Or you could make enough profit. Those trips to India were very profitable. So you could make enough profit with half of your ships to, to build new ships. Okay? So that is the idea of diversification, which was understood a long time ago by people, okay? especially the traders in the sea. So when we are investing, for the marginal investor, we also should think about diversifying when we invest. Okay? If I invest in stocks, Normally I should invest in at least six different companies, six different industries, and so on. So here we can have we can have risk which we can diversify and risk which we can't diversify. So let's start with the risk that we can diversify. Uh, first of all, we have project risk, uh, which is firm specific. Okay? So if I invest in one project in my company, or if I invest in two projects, or three different projects, then this can uh, be diversified. For example, in my company, I invest in a project of making cars, okay? Then the car industry goes very bad, my company can have a problem, right? So I could invest in another project, not making cars, also making clothes. So it helps me. Uh, then we can have the risk of the competition. Competition can be weaker or stronger than anticipated. Okay. So how can a, a company deal with this? They can buy their competitors. Okay. Uh, next one is the entire sector may be affected by an action. So we saw there was a crisis in the financial <coughs> industry. When we had the financial crisis, what kind of things industry was affected, especially? What do people stop buying when there's some economic crisis? What's the first thing people stop buying? Cars. cars. Expensive cars, right? So we can see especially the car industry doesn't go as well, or houses, right? Or holidays, people stop buying expensive holidays as well. So, just our sector could be affected. For example, the car industry is affected, okay? So, company needs to diversify across sectors. You can see a company like Samsung is involved in a lot of different businesses, right? So, if we look at the investor, can the investor diversify this kind of risk? Yes, okay? How? By buying stocks in different companies and different sectors. So if I only bought stock in Hyundai and Kia, I could be in trouble if Hyundai and Kia doesn't do well or has some scandal. For example, we find out that Kia's cars are not safe. So suddenly Kia's stock price goes down a lot, right? Or the competition gets better. Toyota starts selling a lot of cars, so Kia's stock price goes down. So I only invested in Kia or Hyundai, I lost a lot of money. Okay? So, the car industry could be affected. So, Kia and Hyundai's stock price goes down. So, basically, I invest across different companies. I invest in SK, I invest in Naver, I invest in Hanna Bank, okay? in finance, in uh, <clears throat> telecommunications, okay? in el electric companies. So, if I invest across all of those, diversify across domestic stocks, all of those different companies in Korea, 
Then there are some prices for Kia. <coughs> it's not as bad. It's not as bad as if I only invested in Kia. So similar to this idea of diversification, okay? I diversify across uh, different companies. So it's a mistake that stock investors can make that they just don't decide to invest in one company. Then there, it's very risky. Of course, it could be that if you invest in one company, risk also is linked to opportunity. So it could be that you invest in Kia, Kia suddenly gets better than the competition, right? The car industry suddenly takes off. You could make more profit too. Okay? But it's more profit, maybe, but more risk. So the next risk is the exchange rate and political risk. So this is country risk. Korea has a problem. Korea's economy has a problem, okay? The Korean won gets very weak suddenly. That happened in 2010, in the crisis. The Korean won went to about 2,000 won for one dollar, instead of 1,100 won for one dollar, okay? So I invested in Korea. The Korean won got very weak suddenly. I can lose a lot of money when I change it back to dollars. So I have a stock which was worth 1,000 won, that used to be worth uh, one dollar, now it's worth just 500 cents, okay, or 50 cents, because of the exchange rate. So how can we deal with this problem? Diversify across countries. I don't just invest in Korea, okay? I invest in Japan. I invest in uh, Germany, I invest in Brazil, in the US. Okay. If I invest in different countries, then one country has an economic crisis, it's not as bad. So all of these things, I can diversify away. So when we are talking about, we mentioned earlier, uh, the marginal investor, the investor who we expect to be buying and selling our stocks. Okay, we expect that the marginal investor knows all these things. And we expect that the marginal investor is already diversified. Okay? If you, you just go and buy one stock, I don't count you as the marginal investor. Because you're not the average investor. Okay? Maybe you don't know enough about investing, so you just bought one stock. So you're not a big investor. But the larger and average investors, they know about these things. So we expect that they already diversify. <coughs> They already diversified this risk, they already diversified this risk, they already diversified this risk, okay? So the risk that we're worried about, we're not worried about this risk when we're measuring risk, okay? We're worried about this one, market risk, okay? Market risk is more interest rates, inflation, uh, news about the economy. It's risk that we can't diversify away compared to the other risks. So we are going to check the headlines on the Financial Times and we are going to do, ask about whether it is positive or negative news. Okay, so we'll do that after the break. So let's take a break now for 10 minutes. <coughs> 